Zinstepsis, which ended up being retracted and being a failure. So be careful and look at this manuscript with a jaundiced eye, as I did. Um, be careful about conclusions that they're drawing on the population base that they're drawing it on. We have to be extremely careful here because I think that there's there it, we may be being led down the path. So we're going to have to be a little bit more careful. In 2000, I'll remind everybody in the room that one, people told us we should be using steroids in all septic patients. Turned out not to be the case. We were also told to tighten glucose control from 80 to 120 in all ICU patients, which turned out not to be the case. Um, so before we jump the gun and say, we found the holy grail, um, let's be a little bit careful about this. And that's why I wanted to go through the details. And, and actually, um, some of the findings of this manuscript, especially in the supplemental section, I actually went into the supplemental section and pulled some of the graphs so that we could have a look. Um, if you look at those supplemental section areas um, and we go through that in detail, we can have a much better idea. Now, the other thing I did wanna tell you is that at the same time as we see this article, there's another article that came out <laughs> using methylprednisolone and in severe pneumonia, and their results were the contrary, no improvement in survival. So we have some uh, conflicting issues in the literature. So let's start by going through this and we'll go ahead and get started. Everybody realizes that pneumonia is a big problem uh, throughout the world, right? Um, and again, it was the ninth leading cause of death in the United States alone and leading cause from infection issues. No question about that. OK. And among people who receive mechanical ventilation, um, pneumonia, any type of mechanical ventilation, mortality can, can get up to 30 percent. So we have to be cognizant of the relevance of this article. I mean, it, that's what they're trying to get you to look at is this is a relevant area, no question, okay? And certainly it can give you all kinds of uh, sepsis related issues um, that we've all, we've all been uh, privy to. Next slide. Glucocorticoids have been around for a long time. We've gone back and forth. The pendulum has gone one way, the pendulum has swung back the other way. Right now, at this juncture, use of corticosteroids in sepsis has been kind of relegated to septic shock patients to reduce the duration of um, pressor therapy. So to really say, you know, has uh, um, this really uh, uh, helped our patients? Tough call. Now, this article really does take a much more aggressive stand um, by taking patients at an earlier stage in their pneumonia and altering their metabolic response to that pneumonia. So there is something to be said for that. So we really have to kind of think through it, but I, I think uh, something to think about. Now, what goes against what we're seeing in this article is that with the exception of one trial, nobody, nobody has been able to show a large difference in mortality. Now, this group showed a pretty sizable difference. So the questions will come up as to how come these guys did something that other groups weren't able to do. So while it's seemingly a, a wonderful new you know, uh, article and a wonderful new finding. It's going to take some convincing here. Um, and yes, it's a large trial, no question. But again, something to think about, okay? Uh, the meta-analyses, again, they reduce the time of clinical stabilization, hospital length of stay, but survival has been something that has been like the holy grail. And, you know, to say we conquered the holy grail, uh, we're gonna have to think about this. Okay, next slide. So they do have a catchy name. 
a Cape Cod trial, right? Uh, community acquired pneumonia evaluation of corticosteroids. Um, and this evaluates whether early treatment with hydrocortisone reduced mortality or not. And I think that the caveat that has to be put into our patient management is that when you're looking at a patient, are you early in the management of the patient or are you catching the patient late? Because the applicability of this data is early and the operative word being early treatment. Um, so again, something to think about. Next slide. Okay. So who did they look at? Well, they, they said all adult patients over age 18 um, and were eligible for inclusion. And if they'd been admitted to one of the multiple ICUs, because they had uh, multiple ICUs in their group that they were, that were studying this, um, and the severity of pneumonia was defined by the presence of at least one of four criteria, right? So the patient was intubated, mechanically ventilated, or not intubated, mechanically ventilated, um, or put on high flow nasal cannula, or they had um, an P to F ratio of less than 300. Um, they thought that these patients all met that criteria. Now, there was also something called the pneumonia severity index, which was included in this grouping. And I personally originally didn't know what a pneumonia severity index was. So I looked it up. Next slide. And it's a criteria by which people say, well, if the patient is an inpatient, the patient um, you know, are you inpatient? Are you outpatient? Is your oxygenation good? Is the phys What are you finding as far as the physical examination findings? So each of these findings to put together make a pneumonia severity index. And the most severe of that is greater than 120, 130 points, um, you know, uh, the, gives you the risk class. So the highest risk class was what was studied. Okay, um, kind of makes sense. Um, and kind of a good grouping. But again, I think, you know, to say um, that this is, you know, uh, the most severe type of patients that we see, well, the classification really doesn't get into ICU severity as much as it does um, pneumonia severity, which is slightly different. Next slide. By the way, if you guys have questions, stop me because I'm, I'm going to plow through. And if you're, if something is unclear or I'm not stating something clearly, please stop me and we'll go over that. Okay. Non-inclusion criteria. Okay. So how did they remove people from this grouping? Well, one uh, was a do not intubate order. Second was if they thought that the pneumonia was caused by influenza because the bad things that steroids uh, do to influenza patients, they were, they were concerned. So they, they kind of took it out. Um, they, the patients all, you know, received state-of-the-art therapy for severe community-acquired pneumonia, including antibiotics and supportive care. Um, but the choice of therapy and the choice of support was left to the discretion of the medical team managing the patient. Okay. So there, there's, you know, there's wiggle room there for people who are participating. And I think that's a, that's not an unreasonable thing to do in order to be able to recruit patients. Next slide. Okay. Within 24 hours of onset of any of the severity criteria above, the uh, patients in the hydrocortisone started their hydrocortisone therapy. The placebo group got their therapy. Um, and by the fourth day, there were predefined criteria. Did the patient get better? Did the patient get not get better? Did they need a higher dose? What was going on? So all this was left open to the medical team to decide. Again, does that give room for bias? Maybe. So we have to think about that. Again, I think, you know, I, like I said, I always look at these, these studies with kind of a jaundiced eye and I'm kind of always uh, looking at, you know, what are they doing and why? Okay. Regardless of the treatment duration, the dose of hydrocortisone tapering was pretty uniform. And I'll show you how they did that. Next slide. Okay, this was how they tapered it. So they would start their treatment on day one, full treatment, and then decide whether they wanted to go eight days or 14 days, and then they would um, adapt to weaning of the hydrocortisone as they chose fit. So again, 
there were multiple choices that were given to the team in order to come off that hydrocortisone dosing that they that they started early on. So again, something to think about. This was in the supplement section, by the way, not in the article itself, but in the supplemental section. And I kind of dug through the supplemental section to kind of pull up uh, each of these things. Next slide. All right, so what were the outcomes? All right, the primary outcome, the one thing that they were looking for, yay or nay, was death from any cause at day 28, which I thought was good. I mean, I, that's a very reasonable thing to look at. And it turned out that they had to stop the trial because there was a huge difference um, between the two groups at day 28. And they had to say, okay, we cannot ethically not give the patients that, um, you know, that got placebo, we could not give them placebo anymore. We had to give them hydrocortisone. But the caveat is that we had to start it early on, not later. And I'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. All right. Then they were looking at death at any cause at 90 days. They were also looking at length of ICU stay, non-invasive ventilation in patients or endotracheal intubation in patients that were not receiving any ventilation. Patients who were uh, endotracheally intubated after they were receiving NIV, whether they got vasopressor therapy, whether number of ventilator free days, number of vasopressor free days by day 28. And they were also looking at change in PA to FiO2 ratio. They were also looking at the change in the SOFA score, the sepsis score um, that we have. So um, let's continue on. Next slide. They also looked at the functionality of these patients. So let's look at the results. I mean, this is what we came here for. So let's go through the results. Okay. Next slide. All right. One thing I did want you to know, and when you look at this, they screened almost 6,000 patients. I know it's a small slide and I know it's hard to read, but if you really look at it, they screened about 6,000 patients and they ended up with 800. Okay. I mean, again, not all patients met criteria, which tells you that not all your patients meet criteria. So you have to be very cognizant of this. And, and this is one thing that I wanted you guys to really understand is they're screening thousands of patients. Don't think that every patient they got in their unit with severe community acquired pneumonia that they automatically put on hydrocortisone and enrolled in the study. That did not happen. So again, something to keep in mind. And one out of, uh, let's see, about seven, six, 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 six to seven patients they enrolled. So think about that. Next slide. And these are questions that I always pose in my mind's eye is, you know, is this really evidence-based and can we say that this prospective randomized trial um, really picked the appropriate population for us? You know, does it apply to our patients? The so what factor, if you will. Okay. So when you're looking at an article, we always have to, I mean, and, and you know, we have, we have a tendency as physicians. Okay. If something agrees with what we say, we think, oh, it's a great article. Um, if something doesn't agree with what we say, then we say, oh, it's crap. Um, you know, so <laughs> I take a kind of a jaundiced eye toward everybody. I hate everybody. Um, so, and in doing so, what I end up doing is I end up going through all the details. Okay. So the characteristics of the patients at baseline, you notice they're pretty comparable. If you look at the various different issues that they looked at, fairly comparable. And, and I'm not all that, uh, you know, impressed by the, you know, the differences between the two groups. I thought the two groups were selected, uh, quite reasonably. All right. And because they came in prospectively, I think it's a very reasonable, you know, look at that. And I think, you know, the number of mechanically ventilated patients, invasive and non-invasive, the numbers look pretty similar. Um, and statistically, I think they ended up being about the same. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what did the results show? And here's the, the crux of it, right? Death by day 28. In the placebo group, they had almost doubled the mortality. They had to stop the trial, okay? Because they couldn't continue. If they continued, they would be in violation of ethics rules. 
So they couldn't do that. So they stopped. Okay. And, and again, the confidence interval was quite good. Okay. Um, and death by day 90 also was similarly big difference. Okay. Um, and again, percentage wise, the confidence interval was quite good. Okay. That's great. Um, the incidence of endotracheal intubation by day 28, almost one and a half times uh, the number of people had to be intubated um, because the sepsis presumably had progressed in those patients um, and the steroids, I guess, prevented that from happening. So again, something to think about. Kind of makes sense, um, kind of makes sense from a perspective of if we had a difference, if that, that big a difference in mortality, this big a difference in intubation and NIV use kind of makes sense. And we'll, we'll get to more of this in a second. Next slide. So this is the graphic version of the, uh, the mortality um, and the percentage of patients that, that died as we went out to 28 days. And you can see that the progression was quite significant. And you can see how the, the mortality risk, um, the mortality numbers was 17 in the uh, hydrocortisone group and 27 in the placebo group. So clearly there was, there was a survival improvement and really, um, this was, you know, important. Okay. The hydrocortisone group had better discharge from the ICU at 28 days, um, had less mortality. So clearly, uh, good things. Next slide. What happened? And when we treated these patients and again, how many were pulled out of the, uh, the grouping? Um, and again, what happened? Okay. And, and how did this happen um, in each of the groups? So as we go through the number of, you know, people that were prematurely stopped or, um, you know, what happened? Well, what happened was you had um, discharged alive from the ICU was the vast majority, right? So once they got discharged from the ICU, they stopped looking, right? So we were okay. All right. Um, and, and again, death before planned uh, end of experimental treatment, the placebo group had a much higher death rate. So clearly that was an issue. Um, and, and again, influenza was about the same in both groups. You can see how the breakdown was. So you can see how the differences were and how they went. And again, um, not all that unexpected, but still there. But we need to look at all these details. So clearly showing it to us is an attempt by the authors to be convincing. Okay, next slide. And, and you can see how the authors are very kind of, uh, how should I put it? Um, a little bit more paranoid that people aren't going to believe them. Um, so again, something to keep in mind, you know, it's how is the person presenting their data? I always look at, you know, and, and if you kind of back off and look at it from a, you know, backwards view, um, you can kind of get that. Okay. Next slide. Um, intubation in patients who did not receive any mechanical ventilation, um, at baseline, you can see was greater in the um, placebo group as compared to the hydrocortisone group. Um, intubation in patients who were not intubated at baseline, slightly greater in the placebo group. And again, um, secondary use of vasopressors, slightly higher in the placebo group, as would be expected. Kind of makes sense. Next slide. The survival still caught me by a surprise, no question. Um, and we'll get into that in just a second. Next slide. The secondary outcomes were also interesting. This came from the supplemental section. Now, if you notice, um, if the patients were mechanically ventilated, the risk difference, um, you know, that if you see the error bars, they cross the zero point, which to me, is interesting because the benefit of steroids seems to be when they're not mechanically ventilated, not when they are mechanically ventilated. Now, when they're mechanically ventilated, there seems to be a mean benefit to a certain point, but the, the real benefit is not there. Again, 
the isolation of the germs. Now, what's interesting was a majority of these patients, they didn't know what the bug was that was coming at your patient. So again, they didn't isolate the germ. Now, their argument is, well, in most pneumonias, we don't get a, get a bug growing out. Okay. Um, but again, if you don't look, you may never know. So a lot of the centers didn't look. So, you know, um, again, I, I have some issues with that. Now, if you're over 65, no question about it, these patients seem to benefit all in all. Now, if they were below 65, again, that error bar is moving in past that zero point. So it kind of gets me a little um, wondering. And again, uh, men, women, okay, there seems to be a general benefit there. Um, and again, the pneumonia score, most of these patients had a higher pneumonia score. So again, I think that, you know, there seems to be a benefit there. Um, C-reactive protein, um, again, greater than, you know, 15. Okay. Those patients seem to benefit. So if you had such a patient, it seemed to benefit if they were below that. Again, the argument is, do they really benefit? So again, while we say all these patients are benefiting, you might have subgroups that do better. So if you want to use them in certain subgroups, my suggestion is, is think about the use in those subgroups and put that together. Next slide. And again, now, did the steroids worsen hospital-acquired infection? No, not really. Um, and was the glucose control any worse? Not really. Um, so really speaking, there was no downside to the steroids as they were being given. So that's something that's, that's a good news. That, that's good for us, okay? To say um, it's not going to hurt your patient to give the steroids. So it doesn't seem to at this juncture, okay? In fact, the placebo um, issue, if you look at cumulative incidence of hospital-acquired infection, the placebo group had higher um, hospital-acquired infection than the uh, steroid group. So really speaking, not bad. I thought, I thought that was pretty good. Next slide. They even went through their limitations, which I thought was good because I went through them too. Um, <clears throat> again, the observed mortality in the control group, again, 11.9%. 27% is a bit high, okay, even for their uh, grouping of pneumonia. Again, 27% is what they anticipated. I thought that was, they put that bar kind of high. Um, usually we don't, you know, even our groups, how often do you see, you know, um, you know, mortality within 28 days in a pneumonia patient, community acquired, first go around, probably not that high. I mean, 11%, I would say is right in, right in that range. So I think that's okay. And again, microbiologic, you know, investigation not mandated. And again, you know, 44%, no microbiology. All right. Um, they did have a small number of immunocompromised patients. Be careful. Do not apply this to immunocompromised patients. I have no idea whether it's beneficial or not, and they don't either. Um, again, um, hyperglycemia was controlled with insulin. They had to use a little bit more insulin in the uh, glucocorticoid group than the non-glucocorticoid group. Take that for what you will. They did not look at weakness. We did. We do see that sometimes in our ICU patients. Um, they did not look at um, again neuropsychological issues. We do see that sometimes in our patients. So again, um, now the continuous infusion versus intermittent doses and the tapering doses. Again no evidence basis for it. They just kind of did that because they wanted to look uniform. Um, so be careful there. Next slide. What were the advantages? It's a large multi-center trial. There seems to be clear and consistent outcomes. Okay. What's the problem? Other trials do not confirm the same outcomes. And this French group has been notorious about positive results for steroids. So take it for what you will. Next slide. This was the study that came out right around this time and said, uh, sorry guys, low dose methylprednisolone does not improve mortality at 60 days. 
what are we supposed to believe? Now, these guys, when they when they wrote their discussion part, they said, well, it's a different steroid. Different steroids can have different effects. Oh, okay. Take it with a grain of salt. Be careful here, okay? Because I'm not buying 100% that, you know, steroids are having your mortality. Boy, that's a tough call. Um, and again, let's think about it. Next slide. This is uh, another trial which showed, again, said, all right, steroids seem to help. Still don't know which way do we go, okay? Not clear yet. Next slide. And don't forget, when 2000 came out, everybody wanted to start their septic patients in, yep, and COVID waves, absolutely. And it may have. Um, and also, you know, uh, Carl said that, you know, the COVID wave may have also fallen right in this time frame, And it may indeed have. Um, and again, um, Corticus, you know, originally came out and said, yes, it's great for sepsis. Then they came out and said, maybe not so good for sepsis, but certainly good for septic shock and severe sepsis. Now, you know, are we is still in love with steroids? Yes, we are. Uh, I'll be honest. I like steroids, all right? But the thing is, is can we say it's evidence-based? Uh, I'd say be a little cautious here. Um, yes, it came out in the New England Journal. Yes, it looks great. Um, is this group known for its uh, unbridled enthusiasm of uh, steroids? Yes. Um, so where do we take this and what do we do with it? Um, I'd say put it in the pile of yes, steroids are good, um, but when given very early. Yeah, meta-analysis, Carl, but the problem is meta-analysis was already done before this. And meta-analysis showed, you know, reduction in uh, you know, pressor use, um, reduced length of stay, but never really panned out as far as survival issues went. And, the, and you're absolutely right about the overlap with COVID. Could it have been a COVID effect? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. And I have a tough time saying um this is you know this much improvement in survival just with steroids oh my goodness i i don't know i mean i have a tough call sushi what do you think next slide we've got it's a question slide so we're okay <laughs> all right <laughs> and i did want to emphasize that our our group is bigger than the questions okay <laughs> so <laughs> but i but i do think that um use of steroids in a prudent manner i think is a good thing sunny uh Sana, speak up buddy <clears throat> hi hi yeah so my concerns yeah like i don't know from where to start if if people can help me with this i think up to date did have a, a previous document that said uh steroid could be used in any pneumonia coming to icu which means requiring an organ support but now I was just reviewing for this journal club. That document has been changed totally. Now they say it is not recommended. Yeah. So, and and that's because everybody has the same skepticism that I do. I mean, I you know, I'm looking at it going, oh, come on, guys. You let it, you, you know, fool me once, 2000. Um, you know, fool me twice, you know, shame on me, you know. And that's been the issue and, and and this group like i said you know if you look at from 2000 on they're the biggest progen you know proponents of steroid use in sepsis and in um pneumonia and in anything they can grab their hands on um they love steroids um and if you go to france the likelihood is is if you get pneumonia probably you'll be placed on steroids um so, um, but is, does that make it evidence-based? I'm not so sure. Carl, what do you think? Um, most of my um, experience has been in the pediatric side since I work in pediatric critical care. Yeah. Uh, I did my PhD in the UK, uh, and they are also proponents of uh, using steroids from time to time. Uh, but they are a little bit more balanced with the approach. So uh, they are huge advocates of uh, steroids for invasive pneumococcal infection. 
as long as uh, the steroids are given within 24 hours of first symptoms, which is usually quite difficult to um, to, to sort of translate to clinical practice, uh, particularly in the context of an, an ICU physician. So it's usually uh, these these kids have already gotten one dose of steroids in the community before they come in, at least in the UK setting. Uh, here in the US, so I work at Boston Children's Hospital, um, and we're we seeing a spike in respiratory viral cases at the moment. And that is also leading to quite a few um, secondary pneumonias. Um, and most of the viral infections are second are uh, due to rhinovirus, human metanumovirus, RSV. We have a little bit of flu, but not as much uh, in terms of the overall proportion. Um, and I think uh, we have been using inhaled corticosteroids uh, because there's always a, a, a sort of a bronchospastic component with all of this. And uh, we haven't reviewed our data yet in the form of a clinical trial, but I think from a clinical uh, perspective, um, it has, it is, it is, it doesn't seem to cause too many adverse events, but uh, very hard to comment on the mortality benefit at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, even even in viral stuff, boy, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people just throwing steroids at these, you know, uh, kids and adults. And I, I know we've been seeing uh, I've got friends of mine who are in the U.S. that are doing lots of pediatric ICU. And I can tell you that they're running across they're they're they've been full they They can't they can't seem to get a break. Um, you know, and in fact, a couple of my friends that originally planned to come to India for camps and stuff, they had to cancel out because they're they're so full in the U.S. I mean, it's just, you know, um, and and the problem is, is that, um, you know, and steroids, unfortunately, are part of the vocabulary. Uh, I, I don't know how to how to get around it, um, you know, for us to say, you know, OK, you know, uh, maybe we don't want to give steroids is kind of difficult because um, every primary care doc is going to pose that question. Oh, aren't steroids supposed to help? You know, and we're looking at them going, man, maybe, maybe not. Um, now, the downside, you're absolutely right. I think we control the downside fairly well, um, provided we use low dose. And the caveat I'll throw is, is we don't go to, you know, 300 or 400 milligrams a day of steroids. Um, you know, that can get dangerous. Um, but I think below, you know, around 200 range. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll buy that. I think that, that you can control the physiologic effects and, and, you know, stay out of, uh, any major uh, trouble. Um, you know, do, do you have any, uh, experience or data or thoughts on inhaled versus, uh, systemic steroids in this context? Yeah. Inhaled. We used a ton of inhaled. Um, in fact, Everybody's been, in fact, since our ventilator circuits are now have the MDI addition, um, you know, the inhaled steroids use has gone through the roof, um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there's no real data because everybody just kind of used it empirically. Um, and now you can't go back. See, these are things like like this. You can't go back. I wish we could. I mean, it's like the mannitol in uh, in brain injury. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, you can't go back uh, because no one will let you. Um, so it's the same thing with inhaled steroids, uh, you know, and, and IV steroids you can restrict to a certain degree. But inhaled, you're not going to be able to restrict them. And, you know, does it really benefit? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of bronchospastic issue. No question. Anybody who's intubated... There's bronchospastic issue, um, and that seems to be clear. I mean, we're seeing that both adult and pediatric side, we're seeing it. Um, so I'm worried that um, are we using it for bronchospasm or are we, you know, kind of just empirically just throwing it up there and, you know, hoping, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm as much you know, a kitchen sink user as the next guy. But, you know, I, I always save it for desperation. Um, uh, so I, I, I think in the adult side, I would say we use it a little less on the pediatric side. I think they use it a lot more. Um, I just think that it's it's one of those things that um, I've just seen the, the pediatric ICU guys say, well, you know, we're, we're finding that it works. Okay. Have you 
tried not doing it. Well, uh, we use it on a lot of our patients. Okay. Uh, you know, so that discussion will be an interesting one. You know, if you ask them to do a prospective randomized, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of them are going to allow it. They're going to just say it's too late in the game for that. You know, so even on the adult side, I just, how do you recruit people? You can't. You know, you want to run a study. You can't recruit people because they're just going to say, no, you know, I want that, you know, so, you know, you're, you're stuck. I mean, uh, I have a, a question in the comment. They have never mentioned in this about the timing of when it needs to be done. We spoke about less than 24 hours, less than 48 hours. Very difficult to actually think about it less than seven days. That is a question, actually. Have, did they actually comment upon any particular timing, which... Uh, well, that's what that's that's what was their inclusion criteria, right? They really brought it in as their inclusion criteria. So what they did was they said, if unless we catch them that early, we're not enrolling them in the study. That's why they had 6,000 screened. They, I mean, think about it. They screened 6,000 people to get 800. So, I mean, it wasn't that, you know, they, they you know, and it, and it took them that long. You have to, to, you know, and COVID, I'm sure, played havoc on their on their enrollment. Uh, you know, um, and you know they were asking their people, "Do you think this is a bacterial pneumonia, or do you think this is COVID?" Oh, we don't know. Uh, okay, but you know it might be bacterial. All right, in that case, you can enroll. But if they had wash in from COVID, could that have improved survival? Yeah. It, you know, and certainly, you know, if it, they had the wash in and the patients that got placebo never had, you know, weren't actually treated for, you know, with the steroids for, you know, for the COVID, yeah, you could see, you could envision how survival benefited. So, but they didn't mention squat about it in their discussion, really speaking. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives you, you know, pause to say, eh, you know really you know i would have had an entire paragraph on on that alone the washing you know did you have washing did you have an issue with it i don't know i mean it's a tough call mm -hmm. uh, do they mention about the fluid the uh, total fluid given to each of the groups like in co-interventions i haven't read the paper sorry so uh, yeah. like fluid balance was uh, similar in terms of that's an they important didn't, thing. You know, they didn't really, they didn't really get into that uh, per se. Um, they, you know, what they did was they, they, they essentially said, you know, that. Let's see. I mean, let me pull up that that section. Um, they had vasopressor administration, but they really didn't get into fluid balance issues. They kind of left that alone. Yeah, I think yeah, that was a key thing, isn't it? In a respiratory failure study, you got to mention yeah. that. Isn't it like, you know, um, as a matter of diligence, maybe, I don't know, in the supplement. The second thing is how powered is the study? Is it 80%, 90% or lower than that for the primary outcome? Well, Again, primary outcome, it was almost double double the number of people that, that died in the placebo section. So, um, you know, it was a significant difference. Um, so that's why they said we had to stop the trial. Um, it was actually at a at an earlier stop point than they anticipated uh, from their original, you know, proposal. Um, so, you know, I I think that you know they they got uh, an enormous difference. So, you know, that's how they they got at it. So, I mean, why did so many? One of the uh, like you know when you looked at six thousand patients and you get around what eight hundred patients into your trial. Yeah one of the re reasons is it that there was a you know um there was lack of equipoise in clinicians that means clinicians were refusing to put the patients in trial because they did already believe uh, steroids are useful was that a part of their well they they are in the in the in the grouping if you look at if you look at the uh, the powerpoint uh, let's go back for a second uh money go back go back go back go back the the one that with the small print because that was that was where they weeded out 
six thousand to eight hundred. It was in the supplement section. It wasn't. Uh, keep going. Previous slide. Keep going back. Yes. This one, yeah. See, this was the one where they said twelve hundred had septic shock, uh, five hundred ninety-five had uh, suspected inhalation pneumonia, um, five forty-seven did not meet severity criteria, um, four hundred seventeen had influenza. So they they actually broke down all this. But the thing is, is what was interesting was that you know they they had to go through so many. And 123, by the way, declined to participate. You know, so if you look at that percentage-wise, um, you know, 123 out of 800, you're talking a significant number here. Um, so, you, you know, you have to take this study with a grain of salt. I mean, you, you, you know, yes, it looks impressive at first blush, but if you really look closely, I'm not so sure. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm buying it. To be true, isn't it? So the baseline mortality in the control group is what you would question, right? Because when yeah. you show a difference, then what's happening in the control group uh, matters a lot as well. Absolutely. And again, the 12 percent, you know, they're saying, well, it's less than what we would have predicted. Um, but, you know, listen, uh, you know, straw man analogy, right? I mean, if my control group is so weak, um, my study group is always going to look strong. Um, so this is something that, you know, we tell all our, you know, when, whenever we're looking at an article, uh, that's part of our so what, you know, uh, as, far as, as far as this article is concerned. And certainly, you know, what kind of bias was there? What kind of, you know, how did they, they select this grouping that they looked at? Um, and you really have to wonder. And Sana, going to your you know statement about up to date, not not budging on their on their management, I don't blame them. I think that's correct. I think you know um, I think you have to take this with a grain of salt. You know, Sana. I think they had an earlier page that said that they they did recommend steroids for all patients coming to ICU. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure how to pull that up. No. Yeah, I mean, it's a, like I said, I mean, it's this, the, all these patients didn't weren't, you know, initially in the ICU. So, um, you know, this is a, this gets to be a challenge. Um, so again, I, I think these are, these are interesting questions. Carl. Yeah, I think the other comment slash question I have is how applicable it is to a patient population in a tropical area like India where you know rates of tb are high uh, uncontrolled diabetes is high and whether a study like this can be used to inform strategies slash treatment algorithms <laughs> in an indian setting and, I, and that's something else which scares me because we saw I, what I with all the mucomycosis and so on and so forth i agree i agree and i and i believe strongly that uncontrolled diabetes is one of our big nemesis and if you take uh, all of a sudden from you know you're trying to extrapolate data from Western, Western culture that the diabetes is relatively under control to people who have absolutely no control of their diabetes. And now you're, you're you know, sticking them on roids for 14 days. Boy, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we gotta, we gotta think about that. I mean, I, I just have a comment on that itself um, with what Carl is mentioning. Well, in a country like India, most of the patients would be put on steroids even before they come into uh, intensive. Here, I see that there were 547, uh, how much? 500 and 363 patients for other medical conditions. Uh, so that probably will be double to triple with the same number uh, over here. So they probably do need steroids to be enough more than anything is one thing uh, when they come in that sickness. And I've got an interesting look at this particular slide where it mentions those who were. 399 were assigned to receive the placebo group. Two did not receive treatment uh, because they were under legal protection. I'm a bit intrigued by that statement. What does that mean in the US? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, when when they when they withdrew consent, I guess that's the problem, you know. So when they when oh, they withdraw right. consent. So that, that gets to be the issue. I mean, if they withdrew consent, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you have to just back off. Sana. Yeah, the same thing. If you, if when we look at the exclusions, 
looks like all are genuine to me. Like influenza, I have accepted as an indication for steroid. Uh, so my concern is, uh, later have they really looked into among the controls and uh, the cases, how many were bacterial and how many were viral? So that is missing here, I felt. Uh, so in good. that and further going, you see that the control group has a lot more uh, incubated and NIV patients. Uh, but yeah, as you told, is, is it that the steroid caused lesser incubations in the case group and the control group had a, because there was no steroid, they ended up having more incubations? Or was it that that particular cohort was already sicker. I don't see, I'm not sure if we have. Well, they were saying that the SOFA scores were similar. So um, because of that, what they're saying is, okay, we're comparing apples to apples. You know, it's a, it's a tough call. Again, I think, you know, you know, we always look at an article in the New England Journal of Medicine and go, ooh, you know, they must be telling the truth. Um, but, you know, once you start, you, as you guys are seeing, as we dissect the article, as we start really looking closely, um, there are a lot of questions that still arise. And I think um, this is the same thing that the, the up-to-date guys went through. I mean, I think what they did was they dissected this article and they said, is it going to change our management? Probably not um, at this juncture, you know. Um, do you want to take it under consideration? Okay, if you're if you're early in the pneumonia and you think the steroids will help low dose, okay. Um, if you want to try it, go ahead. Um, but if you if you feel that that's not going to really man help your patient management, okay, then don't. Um, there is no real evidence based shot that you're going to get from us, and that's the thing. So I think that's that's how it's going to go. But. Uh, this is a good discussion, guys, and it was a. I thought it was a good, good paper to discuss. I thought uh, you know it gave it gave some salient points and uh, you know, um, good stuff. Sanat. Yeah, I think uh, probably if Dr. Dilip was here, uh, we could have got some insights. So what he tells us, uh, the response to steroids is actually based on the uh, pattern of involvement that we see on the CT scan. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, when I had the same conversation with him. So it is apparently some particular types of uh, pattern of involvement on the CT is only uh, responsive to steroid. So even that is not probably considered here. I don't think there's any comment on the imaging on, in this article, uh, right? Yeah, there, there were some Italian Italian studies that looked at the patterns that, you know, the, the Chinese really got into this with regard to COVID, um, the patterns on the CAT scan and so forth. Um, and there were a couple of studies that came out of uh, the, the Italian group, Gatnoni and that group that said, you know, when, but see the availability, the immediate availability of CAT scans to be able to look for those patterns and look for what you're seeing um, gets to be challenging um, in places like, you know, where, uh, Gatnoni works, you know, they they were the guys who came up with the prone positioning helping ARDS, um, but they could do mobile CT. Uh, they actually hauled the CT right into the ICU and scanned the patient while they were prone and while they were supine. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, that, that allowed them to really look at these patterns and stuff. So I think for us, it becomes a little bit more challenging. I mean, you know, especially for some of our hospitals where we have to send them out uh, to get a CAT scan, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a challenge. So I think that that's that's something we have to think about down the line. All right, guys. Any other questions, concerns, paranoid outbursts? <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. That was a good discussion. Thanks, Khan. My pleasure. My pleasure. And we'll, we'll uh, do more Journal Club uh, uh, issues as well in the future. Thank you. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Very good.